I V M. Hi. You're listening to I V M Daily. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special episode of IVM Daily. I have with me Joel Pereira, who is probably one of the most politically aware people I have ever met in my life. And uh, we're going to get, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about these elections that just happened because we felt that on IVM Daily, we should occasionally mix up all the dating and other kinds of chats with like, you know, some real political talk. <laughs> Thanks, Amit. It's good to be here. <laughs> so what do you think? Uh, BJP, Congress and all the rest of it. Uh, what are your thoughts on what happened? BJP went 0 and 5 for this election. Yeah, BJP did go 0 and 5. It'd be fairer to say BJP went 0 and 3 okay. because I don't think they were in any contention uh, in Telangana or in uh, Mizoram. Okay. Um, but Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, those were like huge losses for them. Considering and they've been incumbent in all three of those, right? They've been incumbent incumbent for all. I think they were in Chhattisgarh for 13 years. Okay. They was in they were in Madhya Pradesh for the last 15 years. Right. They were in Rajasthan for the last five years. Vasundra Vasundra right. Raja's last term. Right, right, yeah, right. So big losses for them. I think the bigger loss, uh, and which is why it's even more significant, is because these are what they call the Hindi Hindu Hindutva states. Okay. Right, like especially Chhattisgarh, that is basically the heartland. Can you say right? that again? Hindi Hindu Hindutva. Hindi Hindu Hindutva. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Those are that's the heartland state. That okay. Like, it's literally Madhya Pradesh, it's in right. the center yeah, of the center. country. Yeah. <laughs> right. And Rajasthan on one side and Chhattisgarh on the other. Right. And uh, this is where they are. They they think that they derive their maximum support from. Right. Right. Because. You know, if these if these kind of wins happened in the south or say in the northeast or, you know, maybe even West India like uh, Maharashtra, they would, people would be like, okay, you know, these are industrialized states, right. these are relatively progressive states and so on and so forth. And, you know, Hindutva hasn't been a big thing as mm. much as say like, you know, uh, Rajasthan and right. uh, MP. Right. So, you know, maybe their wins would have been a little less significant because you know, Maharashtra flip-flops and uh, the South though, has never been Hindu right, to right. begin with. But to lose in these three states, like the next, it would be as big as like losing in Uttar Pradesh so or do Haryana. You, do you think it's local factors or do you think it's national fatigue or what, what do you think is going on here? Um, I think it's a combination of both. Okay, I think, uh, I think no one is taking the agrarian crisis as seriously as they should be. Okay. Right? So the Congress is to some extent because that was their main plank. Right. But when I say no one, I mean all the other players as well, like for instance, the BJP or um, the the media in its reportage. Uh, there's a section of media who thinks that this was a victory for uh, secular forces, which right. I don't believe. Um, because at the end of the day, it's your pocketbook that matters. Right more than anything else and these three states are deeply agrarian mm. right I mean uh, I don't know about Rajasthan I'm actually I'm pretty sure Rajasthan MP and Chhattisgarh I think 70% of their population are rural I would think so I, I, I would not be surprised with that kind of number at all right yeah. because again uh India generally is 50% plus rural and these yeah. three states, at least perception wise, I can't think of that many like huge massive industrial cities or centers or stuff yeah. like that. It's not yeah. that they don't exist, but yeah. I mean like, you know, they're still fairly uh, like the biggest cities in Rajasthan are places like Jaipur and Udaipur, right? In, and uh, also the problem with these three states is that unlike say a Tamil Nadu or a Maharashtra, where there's a decent level of industrialization, um, a state like MP has a very inelastic labor market. It can't, like, you know, if farmers are struggling, it's not like, okay, there, there's this extra workforce is going to be absorbed somewhere else. Like, traditionally, extra la extra farm labor has always been found work in construction, right. for instance, you know, or low uh, low skill industrial work. And these three states, except for some pockets in Rajasthan, you know, closer to Delhi, the Rico area, some pockets in, Uttar, in uh, Madhya Pradesh, these are not industrialized states. Right. So farming is still the primary mode of everyone's earning. Right. right. And when the farms fail, everyone fails. Yeah, that's a... Uh, but I think uh, you'd also notice that there is a... There is a tendency in some of these states to, uh, or rather, there's a tendency in the country at large, right? Uh, and in these states particularly, to romanticize farming beyond what uh, the job uh, or what it actually is, right? The opportunity it actually provides. And uh, by making it so that these people, uh, the, that the people who are existing in these states don't have that kind of mobility in terms of occupation, 
I, I think that adds a lot to these issues, right? And of I course, think, yeah. of course it does. So yeah, there's again, you know, we are our perception of farming comes from the what we look out from, like when we're driving through, like play over from a train or fly over country as they call it in the west and the where you're literally Bollywood uh, romantic Bollywood right? parochial yeah parochial view of farming <laughs> right. per, like almost fetishistic view of mm-hmm. farming the left too mm-hmm. right has romanticized farming because they are you know the entire Jai Jawan Jai Kisan thing and uh What's strange? What's happening now in in the in view of all these losses in the last three or four days? Actually, not the last three or four days, but the narrative is really strengthening them now. Is that the Hindu right wing ecosystem is calling the is calling this a narrative okay. that the left is creating? That you know the farmers are not actually struggling. The farmers are uh, lazy, or you know that they don't deserve what they want. Or they don't deserve what they get. Right. And um, you know because they point to these schemes that the government has created. The you know, right wing is doing this. Yes. The the internet ecosystem. The internet right wing. Yes. The internet ecosystem the is doing this Hindu right now. Hindu keyboard warriors. Yeah. Yes. That's what they're doing right now. Like, and they started doing this. Like, I I don't know if you you we've been we've been in Bombay for a long time, having. A farmer's march in Bombay, for me at least, was a little unprecedented. It hasn't happened right. for a very, very, very long time. I mean, we've had social unrest, but that was mostly like mischief makers from the MNS or the Shiv Sena, you know, burning buses or whatnot. Right. In I was just reading up about this before I got here. And in Bombay, Delhi and Calcutta, in the last year, we've had 12 major farmer protests. Okay. The most recent in Delhi, where a lack of farmers turned up. Right. Hundred thousand farmers turned up in Delhi. Not even to like you know like f- earlier on when we had these farmer protests, it was a certain community of farmers demanding a certain thing. Right. Like free electricity, like you know the jut um, upheavals in Delhi a couple of years ago, or the Gujar based um, upheavals for like uh, land uh, acquisition and so against land acquisition and so on and so forth. Right. But this was. Overall farmers just coming to big cities and saying, hey man, hear us out. Hmm. We are in trouble. Right. You know, and when the, when the farmers march happened in Delhi, I think two weeks ago, Mm -hmm. it was barely covered in the, in the national media. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I remember hearing about the Bombay, there was another farmers march in Bombay. It happened in March. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember hearing a lot about it at that point in time, but uh, this Delhi one, mm. I, it just kind of came and went. I knew about it because we spoke about it on some other stuff, but, yeah. uh, but I was kind of like, wow, okay. Again, and it's a big deal, right? Yeah, 100,000 yeah. is not a small number. It's not a small number. And these are people for whom mobilizing these people is not easy. It's not. Because it's difficult for you to, if you if you live in a village, it's difficult for you to get to the city, leave right. your home, and leave your, your land, your farm, and yeah. come to the city and, you know, and protest about something. Right. And their demands are extremely reasonable. Can you uh, outline some of them so that people have an idea of what it's kind mostly, of... It's mostly the MSP, mm-hmm. right? It's mostly... A, a, they want to cut a lot of the red tape out because the government has created a lot of these BIMAs and Yojanas. Mm-hmm. And for instance, farm insurance and mm-hmm. um, a minimum price uh, point. Right. A minimum sale point, sorry, which the is... Minimum uh, supply uh, something, isn't it? The, uh, uh, support pricing. Support pricing, minimum sorry. Support yeah, minimum support pricing. Which the farmers are not getting. Right. And in a state like Telangana, mm. where uh, they won, that government told the farmers, we are just going to give you cash. Okay. You know, we're not going to do any of this nonsense. Right. Every time, you know, every with every, uh, uh, with every harvesting season, we're going to give you a certain amount of money. Interesting. And yeah, there's a lot of theory around that, right? In terms of how, what is the best way to kind of deliver governmental services, right? And mm-hmm. uh, I've read a lot of theories where cash is simply the best, right? Because yeah. then what, what what you do from that is that the person gets to spend the money the way they need to spend it. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, virtue signaling around this, right? Where people are like, no, you can't do this because they will go and they will spend all their money. Uh, I, virtue signaling is the wrong word. But uh, they'll go and spend the money on booze and they'll waste it and this and that, right? So, I mean, like, that has never been a very uh, cogent argument in my head. I think that's a very conservative argument. Yeah. Because conservatives, I, I feel uh, emotionally, you think- tend to look at everything from a very jaundiced point of view. Okay. I mean, that is the conservative, right? I mean, right. you want to preserve what you have. And these arguments come up. We've seen that in America mm-hmm. with the Medicare or, you know, food stamps right. or social security where you have the Christian Republican conservatives talking about, oh, everyone will be lazy and, you know, pull up mm. your bootstraps and welfare queen and right, so on and right. so forth. In India, that argument is beginning to happen yeah. now among certain sections of 
the urban classes mm. where they believe that you know farmers deserve less a farmer shouldn't get uh, you know farmer should be part of the free market and the market decides and so on and so forth i think farmers need to be more participatory in the markets i mean like, i do think that no, as i agree well. too i agree too but i think it's to their benefit if they are right because right now what happens is that when they know that there's an msp for a certain crop they're kind of uh, they're kind of forced into that particular crop mm. right uh, whereas they're not making decisions based on what is the best output for their land what's going to what, what's going what, what, the decisions are not based on that and that in that introduces a negative external, externality in this in this context see i think i mean it's a little more complex than that hmm. and this is a, a mistake that a lot of us sitting in the cities make uh, turning around a crop hmm. or deciding what crop you're going to uh, farm that year is not a, an easy decision making process right, right? and these guy these farmers are not being backed by technology they're not being backed by modern practices you know if you're a if you're an industrial farm in delaware or in like iowa mm. let's say you know if you're part of the cargill enterprise and tomorrow cargill realizes oh my god so we're going to switch we're not going to do corn this year we're going to do soy right it's easy for them right right when you have literally the entire country of uh, or the entire state of iowa growing the same crop right. on the other hand in india we have you know uh, fractured farms we don't have that much mechanization uh, farmers are not necessarily you know plugged in into the global uh, commodities market mm-hmm. where they may be like okay we're not going to do urad this year we're going to do tur right or we're going to grow masoor instead of uh, peas mm-hmm. you know so it's very easy for us to sit and say that you know this are these are th- they need support that has to i mean like we were talking about it earlier right the free market is only free if it's fair right and uh, to say that farmers should be entering the commodities market should be entering the open market it can't just happen immediately no it's not i'm not expecting it to happen immediately but i want them to have the ability to make choices right mm. and i think that that is something right now which they are constrained from doing mm. uh, because of the way the uh, because of the way certain things are structured right whether it is uh msp whether it is having to sell at these uh, certain markets only right having to that be- has been uh removed it's changed in some places the apmc I, yeah, no the I, apmc act in a lot of places has been removed it's a state by state thing if i'm not mistaken yeah it's state by state so thing. i mean like yeah. it's it's uh, it's no longer there in maharashtra yeah. and it's no longer there in a few other states yeah. but nationwide as a whole it's not kind of yeah. there and i think uh, i think things like these right what these do is they uh, they create a much higher degree of power in the middleman then in the supplier or the producer producer yeah. and i think that is a uh, it also ties into things like for instance direct invest investment into the cold chain yeah right which uh, foreign companies like say carrefour or a tesco or a safeway have the technology and the know how on how to do these things we don't we mm-hmm. obviously don't but at least 30% of our wet wet stock as in the sense when i say wet stock you know fruits and vegetables right rot before yeah. they reach the market which yeah. is criminal it's insane yeah. Con- considering the prices we pay for these yeah. things it is insane so that so once you have these investments made you know in a proper cold chain in foods in 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 securing your your food stocks etc cetera, etc cetera, then i think you can begin to uh, talk about uh, you know farmers entering the market or dealing with themselves right. or whatever I think, uh, but but I I do think that you will start seeing more and more because I I was listening to a. And I'm sorry, I just I don't hmm. want to interrupt you, but we actually have a very successful collectivization program. Hmm. It's called Amul. Yeah, you that's know? true. It's a very very successful collectivization program. It, is. it Amul essentially runs all dairy. Yeah, and it's it's not tainted. Huh. You know with. the issues that there's no reason why you cannot have a similar program for rice or wheat agreed as as amul has done for dairy agreed agreed you know? agreed i i think that makes it yeah actually i guess that makes it no sense that yeah. that yeah because right. i mean a lot of people a lot of free market um enthusiasts will talk about you know collectivization bad it's so polite <laughs> enthusiasts <laughs> collectivization bad and you know a free market good wow. but we actually have a really good example of a really positive example of where these where both of them have been merged right right with amul because they are selling their product on the free market because there there is competition in the dairy industry right. but at the same time at the base level they have collectivized they have collectivized this yeah, yeah and i think but, but that's a that, that's a really interesting kind of way to kind of look at the model right because yeah. the access to the market and the fact that uh, 
pricing is determined by market and stuff like that. That brings in certain efficiencies in terms of the on the demand side, right? Yes. But from the supply side, what you're doing is most of the people who are involved in the supply side are traditionally in the disadvantaged areas of society. Yeah. So by providing them a certain collectivization kind of this, you're being able to yeah, it's best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And yeah. and it's 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 working so yeah. far. Yeah. And it's all right. Uh, let's take a quick break and then let's come back and let's talk a little bit about like the elections instead of going off on these farming tangents. <laughs> <laughs> Family businesses get a bad rap. At one time, they were looked down on for getting rich, for being too ambitious. Today, they're still looked down on, but for not being ambitious enough. Not agile enough, not modern enough, too traditional in their mindset. The biggest brands and business houses in the country started out as humble family businesses. It's the way India has done business. Join Sonu Basin in conversation with stalwarts of Indian family businesses on the Inheritors podcast series by Bloomberg Quint. Discuss the highs and lows, the needs and pressure points of building a business legacy that spans generation. All right, and uh, we're back. And so uh, we went on quite a long discussion about farming. Yeah. But uh, you know what? I wanted to ask you like about this election mm -hmm. uh, specifically, right? And um, so one of the things I was looking at over here is that, uh, and this is something that I kind of feel, right? I feel like young leaders in this country are generally marginalized. Okay. I think that uh, I remember when Mother Ross India died and he was called a young leader. And I was like, oh, yeah, young leader. And then I saw he's 57 years old. Yeah. Right. And I mean, like that does not seem particularly young to me. Hmm. Uh, what we're seeing right now is uh, in um, uh, Rajasthan, we're seeing a fight between Gelot and Sachin Pilot. Yeah. And in uh, Madhya Pradesh, we're seeing a fight between Kamal Nath and uh, Jyotiraditya Sindhya. Yeah. In both cases, at least in the case of Jyotiraditya Sindhya, he has conceded to Kamal Nath. Kamal Nath is going to be the acting CM in mm -hmm. the K or is going to be the CM for uh, MP. Uh, and the conversation between Gelot and uh, Pilot is still, or, or rather, the discussions over there are still going. What do you think about this? What do you, What are your thoughts? Do you think that we do this to our young leaders? I don't think it's intentional because there are plenty of young leaders who have actually succeeded. I mean, okay. outside of, um, say, and in India, you have to just agree that all a lot of young leaders are dynasts, right? So that they have is, that, that, that that's the, I mean, like, we're, what are the last names we just used, right? Yeah, Pilot exactly. India. It's like, for instance, Omar Abdullah was very young yes, when he, he became the chief minister of yes, Kashmir. And there were lots of senior Kashmiri uh, or people, uh, politicians from Jammu and Kashmir who could have been uh, uh, CM, right. but he was chosen. Devendra Fadnavis is quite young. He is quite young. And again, in the Maharashtra, the BJP ecosystem, there are plenty of older people they could have chosen. That is true. Uh, Jalalita was very young when she became CM of Tamil Nadu hmm. back in the 80s for the first time. So I think it's, it's. I don't think you can generalize as far as whether we make our young, we, we penalize our, our young politicians. Rajiv Gandhi was, I think, 43 when uh, he became Prime Minister of India. Interesting. Well, I, I, except for Fandavis and Jalalita, I think every other person you're talking about is family, though. His family, yeah, yeah. that's right. So, no, that's 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 true because that's that's a, what I that was a caveat to my point yeah. that you know that you have to consider the dynasties because there are, a lot of them are. Do you think internal uh, political democracy or internal party democracy helps with this to an extent? Because I mean, uh, there was an interesting story about how Rahul Gandhi asked uh, the party workers. Uh, what they, uh, who they should, uh, who should be the CM uh, yeah, for their particular yeah, state, yeah. right? Do you think that helps or do you think that I'm just barking up a tree which has no point to it? I think in any political party, the balance is always between funding and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. You know, among your, and funding is from the old. Right. And enthusiasm is from the young people. Okay. So as in any political party or structure or system, that's how it normally works. I mean, that's what normally works, right? Right. And um, finding that balance between uh, between enthusiasm and uh, and funding is what they are doing right now. Funding and also uh, relationships. Hmm. I mean, Gaylord or Kamal Nath, just by virtue of the fact that they've been alive longer, know more people. They know more people. And, and they've both been like, they're, 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 they're not exactly like, you know, people who are just rising through their party lines. They both have done, signif they've done both significant accomplishments. Yeah. I mean, Kamal Nath has been a chief minister before. Hmm. Uh, Gaylord too. Yep. So it's not as if they are um, they are being propped up by you know by some sort of old guard of the right. party or whatever. So I don't think um, I mean a lot of people say it and and that's a lot of times that's a narrative also. Hmm. But the media knows who they are pandering to. So right, which is I guess younger people, younger people. Yeah. yeah. So to me, one of the things that comes across in this thing, right? Uh, one of the reasons why I feel that we should uh, try and empower more uh, younger uh, leaders, particularly is. 
the world has changed so much in the last 30, 40 years, right? I mean, like, it's just completely different in so many different ways. I mean, 35 years ago, we didn't have color TV in this country. Yeah. And uh, now today, every third person is walking around with like a 4G connection in his pocket, right? Yeah. Uh, and I and think, every other person has a cell phone. Well, yeah, every yeah. everybody has a cell phone. Yeah. I think it's like 70%, 700 yeah. million, seven, yeah. 800 million connections. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, idea that uh, somebody who has spent more than half his life in a era where media was not important mm -hmm. particularly, where you could control narratives in ways that are almost impossible to imagine today, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, and I, I, I'm not trying to be ageist over here, but I do think that... Uh, the skills for uh, thriving in a modern world are things that are probably, and you want optimal performance here, right? Yeah. And I feel like that optimization happens with people. And I'm not saying kids. I'm not saying don't. I'm not saying get a 25 year old as chief minister, right? Yeah, but I yeah. mean, like you know, with people who are more familiar with what's going on on a day to day basis, who are not as isolated from. Uh, Te and technology is just one piece of it, right? Mm. I mean, like, cultural mores have changed so much. Mm. And all mm. of this stuff, right? So, I mean, like, how... Uh, I, to me, that, I think, is an interesting or, or an important factor in terms of why I think it's more important that young people are empowered more. I would agree with you, but then I would also disagree with you because I would say that we are in a representative democracy mm -hmm. and young people don't vote that much. In, in which case, screw them. In, 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 yeah. in Bombay, in yeah. India, sorry, yeah. or even globally, I mean, yeah. the global trend is that young people don't vote as much as old people do. And mm. if we, and which is why a lot of times the social mores that you're talking about right. appear last in politics. Right. Right. Because, like, for instance, in the US, most people were okay with homosexuality in the early 90s. Yeah. Right. Most people were okay with gay marriages in the early 2000s. Yep. And yet it took till 2013 for before the Supreme Court. And still no politician would touch it. Yeah. Did the Supreme Court, you know, a switch of eight, like the like three seven seven in India, mm -hmm. and I think that's because there aren't enough young people voting and there aren't enough young people representing them. So mm. I would agree that there need to be younger people in in politics, but I don't think it's as bad as uh, I don't think it's 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 holding us back in any way because yes. So I I'm in the business of content, right? right. I create I create content. I've been doing it for many many years, and I've always believed. That the medium changes, but the messages kind of remain the same, mm. you know. And I think if you're an older, older leader or an older politician who recognizes that fact, who's like, okay, you know, it's not like Sachin Pilot is saying anything new. Mm. He's saying it in new ways, right? From a new face, right? But he's not necessarily like you know, he doesn't have any groundbreaking revolutionary ideas, you know, which which have come to him because he's young, right? Right. Every politician since the last hundred years has has known and valued the importance of mass communication. Mm -hmm. It's not like you know uh, the internet just appeared yesterday, and before that we were using smoke signals. No, we've no, of had, not. Yeah. We've had different different methods of communication. Whether Roosevelt did the fireside chats, whether Narendra Modi is doing the monkey bath on the radio. I don't know if that's necessarily. I think a, there are significant differences. I mean, like from a pure communication theory perspective, I think there's some significant differences between. Uh, what was then the broadcast kind of this, where mm -hmm. you have essentially one to many transmission, mm -hmm. whereas over here what you have is you probably you have one to many, but then you're responded with many to one, and there's an immediacy to you know I mean like yeah, from yeah, from yeah. From, yeah. from a purely kind of like you know theoretical perspective in terms of how communication occurs. Okay, no, I was looking at from the overall message versus right. like you know the day to day communication. No, uh, the reason I bring that up is because mm. I think that the uh, the the fact that the methodology of communication changes. Yeah. I think what that does is that requires different skills is a very strong word, but mm. different emphases are required in terms of how you do your communication. Yeah, so. I'll give you an example from the U.S. elections. OK, uh, there was Barack Obama in 2008 mm -hmm. who was not very Internet savvy, mm. but was at that time, I think, 43 years old. Yeah. When he was elected for the first time something in 2008. Like I think, yeah. I think might be a little younger than that. Early, like something late, like that. Early 40s. Early 40s. Let's say early 40s. Yeah. Who is not big on tweeting and so mm. on and so forth. And then you have someone like Donald Trump. Right. Who, became, who started his his political ascendancy when he was 70 years old. Right. Right. And it happened because of Twitter. Hmm. So. Interesting. You couldn't think that, you wouldn't say Barack Obama is not savvy. He no. is. He is very. But right. 
it was a medium he chose to he, he, he I, I don't know if he chose to ignore or wasn't familiar he with wasn't part, comfortable with well i mean like twitter started in 2007 he became president in 2008 so it's I'm, not i'm using twitter as an example yeah. but there were other i mean so web 2.0 had so happened so web 2.0 had happened and he used the web very effectively but it wasn't driven by him it was driven no, by it was driven people, by his supporters yeah, yeah it was driven by supporters but the point is that either way the result was the same he won the election both times right. even though so what i'm trying to say is that even an older person you might not be technologically savvy as long as you identify that and right. i guess if you can get people to do it for you hmm. i think i don't think i think that bridge can be gapped yeah interesting okay yeah i i don't uh, disagree with that i think that, that or uh, why am i using obama and trump modi, modi and yeah. rahul gandhi yeah. rahul gandhi got on twitter 2 years ago yeah exactly and and modi and got on twitter in 2011 yeah, 12 a long time ago yeah. and he's been very effective on yeah, it so yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And Rahul Gandhi is now considered to have like some decent ideas and well that's because he's got a good team it really it, exactly he, yeah yeah you can uh, interesting yeah uh okay all right uh i think i'll buy that i i, th- I think i'll agree with that um that age is not as big a deal as i'm making it out to be i i don't think, see uh, the problem that i have is something that we haven't brought up hmm. it's the reverence for age that's a whole that different I have thing. issue with right? i have a whole i have a whole problem with reverence in general yeah no and especially in this context with age yeah. because indians are taught to respect your elders etc yeah. reverence is not automatic right respect it, is an automatic it, it has to be earned. earned and it doesn't matter if you're like 40 or 70 mm-hmm. it still has to be earned mm-hmm. and that is my but i doubt the congress is going to make a chief minister decision based entirely on who they respect more but i i don't think they're doing it that uh, uh, yeah no i don't think they're doing that right mm-hmm. but i also do think that um, deference to age is a part of the calculus right because among their constituents uh not necessarily yeah amongst the constituents yeah. uh, um, um, amongst the people who they are trying to so they're playing into that narrative of deferring to age right yeah. that uh, your wise grandfather is the prime minister correct you know or the chief minister yeah. so i mean like they're, they're they're definitely playing into that narrative yeah Awesome, Joel. That was fun. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah, it was an interesting, fun conversation. This is probably one of the longer IVM dailies that we do. <laughs> Most of these episodes are like twelve minutes long. And today but, was uh, oh wow. Yeah, okay. we're close to twenty-five, uh, thirty minutes. So yeah, but it was a fun conversation. And uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, where can people reach out to you on social media? Do they? Do you do social media? Or are you? Not, I am on social. So media, you're Rahul, you're really. like the Rahul Gandhi type. Yeah, I need someone to handle it for me. <laughs> I need DVS but then I'd handle it for me. All right. Uh so Joel is uh not on social media in an effective way, I guess. Yeah, I am on social media. I think my Twitter account is Pereira Joel. Okay. Uh at Pereira Joel. So tweet at him if you disagree with anything you say or if you agree with everything he says. Yeah. And you probably will not get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> And uh all right, thank you guys. Thank you so much. Did you know that Parsis in Mumbai instead of being left at the tower of silence after they die are now cremated and why because a cow fell sick in the early 1990s Did you know that the smog in Delhi is caused by something that farmers in Punjab do and that there's no way to stop them Did you know that there wasn't one gas tragedy in Bhopal but three one of them was seen but two were unseen Did you know that many well-intentioned government policies hurt the people they're supposed to help Why was demonetization a bad idea? How should GST have been implemented? Why are all our politicians so corrupt when not all of them are bad people? I'm Amit Verma and in my weekly podcast The Seen and the Unseen, I take a shot at answering all these questions and many more. I aim to go beyond the scene and show you the unseen effects of public policy and private action. I speak to experts on economics, political philosophy, cognitive neuroscience and constitutional law so that the insights can blow not only my mind but also yours. The Seen and the Unseen releases every Monday. So do check out the archives and follow the show at seenunseen.in. You can also subscribe to The Seen and the Unseen on whatever podcast app you happen to prefer. Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc., etc. It's all content, and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. 
We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content, and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. Advertising is Dead.